I'm Tony Bruski. Welcome. We hope you've enjoyed our coverage on the trial of Alec Murdoch. This is a look back at some of the key moments and conversations that we've had over the last several weeks regarding the case. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruski. We are talking with former deputy district attorney and experienced criminal defense lawyer, Lewis Goodman on this segment. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into the evidence gathering because it's a very interesting argument that's being made uh, on the defense of Alec Murdoch. At one hand saying, we feel that it was sloppy and there wasn't enough uh, that was done in terms of evidence gathering. While at the same hand saying, everything that we have we don't think a lot of it points to Alec. The parts I kind of do, we're just not going to talk about. So which is it? When you look at this case, uh, Lewis, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Uh, was there a sufficient evidence gathering here? All evidence gathering is sloppy. How so? Well, I think that it's easy later on to look at investigators and look at police officers and say, okay, you should have done this. You should have done that. You should have bagged this, this way. You should have bagged this that way. You should have dusted this, this way. You should have done something different. Uh, when investigators and police officers go out to these kinds of scenes, I don't care how much experience they've had or how many times they've seen dreadful bloody scenes uh it it creates an emotional difficulty in anybody and sort of bangs into their professionalism and it's always chaotic mm -hmm. um and so evidence is gathered but it's rarely uh a, a perfect gathering of evidence and that is something that is always poked at by whoever it is that's trying to question that evidence. Uh, evidence could always be gathered more carefully or more effectively. Uh, so I don't think there's anything about the way the evidence was gathered in this case that's particularly unusual. Uh, could it have been done better? Sure. But is it, you know, a, a workmanlike gathering of evidence? Yeah, I think I think that it is. And I think that the the real problem for the defense here is how there really isn't any evidence that was gathered that tends to show somebody else was on that property uh, during that very limited period of time that Mr. Murtaugh was away. I mean, we're only talking about an hour and a half to two hours. And that, that is an interesting point. There hasn't been anything showing anyone else. The only thing that I guess we could uh, talk about is there was uh, some other DNA, I guess, found under one of Maggie's fingernails. Uh, but that was it. They, there was no physical evidence on the property uh, that showed anything. Uh, I guess one could argue maybe was it contaminated? Was there just too many people on the scene and maybe... Uh, some of that, you know, went away or, or was undetectable. Uh, but that that is something that has never been pointed out. All it's been pointed out is that uh, at least try to be argued that uh, Alec was not there. But there's so many pieces that point to him actually being there. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's one of those things you, you look at and you just don't know where to uh, to go with it. One of the things that I uh, thought was a very interesting statement that uh, Alec made uh, when he was talking earlier today uh, was about the permissions that he gave uh, SLED uh, to be all over his property, saying he could, they could go anywhere, they could look at anything, they could ask for access to anything, they didn't need a warrant. He was there. He was ready to give anything and everything uh, that he could at that moment. He's even sitting. He sat down with the police right away without his attorney talking. Uh, these are things I'm sure he would have advised almost any of his clients not to do. 
but he was willing to do that. Is that something that a guilty person would be doing? I see people who are professionals all the time thinking that they can talk their way out of things and they can explain themselves uh, and they can do things that they know professionally can't be done. I can't tell you how many police officers I've represented who I've had to literally put a, a bag over them and say, do not talk to investigators because you cannot talk your way out of this. And, you know, telling them that you used to be a police officer or whatever it is, you know, that and five and a half bucks will get you a cup of cappuccino. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't work. And, and people who are lawyers, people who are police officers, they somehow think that, that they can do what other people cannot in terms of talking to investigators and I suspect that Alec fell into that trap that he could see at any time for a client, but he couldn't see it for himself. Do you think Alec is in that same trap right now when he's on the stand that he thinks that he will be able to present this better than anyone else can and going against the advice of his counsel, he's up there talking? I, I don't know what his counsel is, has advised him. I mean, he's not a, he's certainly, as we've discussed, not a bad witness. Uh, I don't think he's so far hurt his case any. I think that he's, if anything, helped his case. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, and, you know, there, there are certain things in this world that are known as client decisions. And the big client decisions are whether to take a deal or go to trial whether to go to a jury trial or a bench trial. And if you do go to trial, whether you testify or you don't testify, those are the big client decisions. And as an attorney, you can advise a client about testifying. And I don't know what advice he got about this or not, but you know, Alec may very well say, look, I understand I'm in a lot of trouble here and I really need to explain myself. Mm-hmm. And that is something that I'm willing to gamble on. I'm willing to roll the dice. I'm willing to spar with the prosecutor on things. Uh, but, you know, the, the question here is, do I spend the rest of my life in prison? And if I do spend the, life, the rest of my life in prison, do I want to say, well, I got here without ever giving myself a chance to get out of this on my own? Do you think Alec's testimony today saying he lied uh, and making that admission was something that his defense knew about early on? Or was that a bombshell that was dropped on them here towards the end of, look, guys, I lied about all this because half of their arguments were arguing his lies uh, over the last uh, several days or weeks? Oh, I think that they very clearly planned on admitting the lies and then moving on from that. Um, you know, it's it's like when you go to talk to the probation department, what you want to say is, I did it, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. Mm -hmm. This is basically doing that. You're saying, I understand that there's this web of lies. I created that web of lies. I'm sorry I created that web of lies. I shouldn't have done it. There may be some explanations involving, you know, my prescription drug use or whatever that that contributed to that. But now in thinking about it, I recognize that I really need to come clean about everything. And one of the things I need to really come clean about is this web of lies. And I did it and I'm sorry. And it's not going to happen again. And it's certainly not happening with respect to the really key question in the case as to whether or not I shot my wife and son. And that I didn't do. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Lewis Goodman, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your insights. Uh, Lewis, former de de deputy district attorney in uh, Alameda County and also an experienced criminal defense lawyer always interesting to hear 
some insight from your perspective on these cases. We'd love to hear your perspective, too. You can, of course, participate in our group Facebook page. There's a link in the episode description right here. Or you can call toll-free and uh, leave us your thoughts. You may use it on a future episode. 888-5-KILLER is that phone number. 888-554-5537 to share your thoughts with us. My name is Tony Bruschi. Press subscribe wherever you download podcasts. You don't miss any more of our continuing coverage into this case and all the cases that we're following for you right here with Hidden Killers and True Crime Today.